So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Stephen Deeks from the University of California, San Francisco, who will be giving our overview uh, today and talking about uh, therapeutic vaccination. Thank you, Tim. Yes, I was, um, uh, and I won't take this extra time. I'm going to try to get through this quickly so that we can get to the real science. Um, what, what I want to do here and what I was asked to do here was talk about uh, where we think might, we might be going in terms of therapeutic vaccine and put that discussion in the context of the presentations later on uh, in this session. All right, so I'm going to start off with one of the greatest hits of Dr. Hendrick here, um, Tim, uh, and a uh, collection of friends and colleagues from around the world uh, in our group um, characterized this individual uh, who actually went on PrEP basically on day one of Phoebic One um, when his viral load was about a couple hundred copies. Uh, and then he went on art, and he stayed on art uh, for about two years. And at the end of that two years, Tim and others had gone as deep as they could to try to find virus in this gentleman, looked at 1.5 billion CD4 T cells in total. Everything was basically negative. We thought he might have been cured. He thought he was cured. He stopped therapy. Nine months later, virus rebounded. In hindsight, we figured that his reservoir size at the time he stopped therapy was basically a couple hundred replication competent variants. There are now many of these cases, and I think there might be another one uh, later on today, or at least there are several in the cohorts that will be discussed by Monique, uh, of individuals who've undergone very heroic uh, interventions, um, gene therapy, allogeneic bone marrow transplant, uh, very, very early art, and so forth. Um, and essentially, in each of these cases, you have a situation of an exceedingly low reservoir yet the virus rebounds. Um, and I, my take-home message from this, I feel very strongly about this, is that in the absence of something like the Berlin patient had, it's probably going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to, to eradicate all virus. We are going to need an immune system that will be able to take care of whatever virus is left, and it's going to have to take care of that virus for 30, 40, 50 years. And as far as I understand, uh, the only thing that can do that or T cells. Um, and we have a good model for this. There are many elite controllers out there who have been suppressed now for decades. And when you dig in deep to figure out exactly what's going on in those patients, um, there are multiple pathways involved, perhaps, but certainly at the heart of elite control are the sustained HIV specific CD T cells, which apparently appeared, at least in blood, to have a cytotoxic effect. Okay? So the question then becomes. How do we generate these? Um, and probably the easiest way, or the way it's going to be most effective, is to gene modify stem cells. And we have uh, proof of concept for this um, in terms of the Berlin patient. Uh, other gene therapy approaches will be discussed uh, by Andrew in this session. Uh, CAR T cells are also exciting. There are some data emerging that antibodies um, can form immunocomplexes and that these immunocomplexes uh, can be, um, have a vaccinal effect. And perhaps, uh, it's a bit of a push, but perhaps um, the alpha-4, beta-7 antibody uh, uh, um, effect that was seen at least in one study may have been due in part to this. Uh, we will hear an update on this very interesting study in the late breaker at the end of the session. But I would argue that, um, that these approaches are not going to be scalable. If we are going to have a global impact, if we are going to truly actually use a cure remission to change the trajectory of this epidemic, it's going to have to be scalable, affordable, basically one shot in the arm, and I think the only thing that can do that will be therapeutic vaccines, for which we have proof of concept outside of HIV. So my central thesis is that we really, really are going to need uh, a therapeutic vaccine, um, and I don't think a lot of people like to hear that uh, for the reasons I'm about to uh, discuss. Now, therapeutic vaccines, in my opinion, can do two things. They can kill the reservoir um, during ART, or they can control the reservoir post-ART. Um, and I think many of us who've been following this field have thought that the most exciting therapeutic vaccine out there, one that looked like it was able to kill SIV-infected cells, is the CMV uh, SIV vaccine that Lewis Picker, Jeff Lipson, and others have been developing for years. When this vaccine is given as a prophylactic, prevention in SIV uninfected animals, and these animals are um, exposed to SIV, uh, they all become infected, but half, and it's very important, half of these monkeys 
clear their infection over a period of about one to, one to 1.5 years, okay? So they're, they're infected. So the CMV vaccine does not prevent infection. Um, the virus persists, uh, but over a period of about 18 months, it wanes. This happens in half the animals. Uh, the other half of the animals, it fails to happen. Uh, but the assumption was, was that the CD8 positive T cells in this study were killing the reservoir cells. In a study that will be published by, by Atham Okei, Lewis Picker, and Jeff Lifson in Nature Medicine, I believe, next month, and they've dug in pretty deep into this idea. They, first of all, did a therapeutic vaccine study in which they took monkeys, put them on, um, S, gave them SIV, put them on treatment, showed that the CMV vaccine in that therapeutic setting was immunogenic, did a controlled study, half the animals got the CMV vaccine, the other half did not. Stop therapy, nothing happened between the arms. They were identical. Uh, and during ART, the CMV vaccine had no impact at all on the size of the reservoir. But, and this gets a little tricky, um, but uh, what they did find is that if you gave animals ART on around day four of their infection, the animals were infected, and then over a period of about 18 months, the reservoir in those monkeys disappeared. And the idea being that early, early, early ART can um, not prevent infection, but prevent latency. And the kinetics and the profile, the characteristics of what that virus did in the context of ART is identical or very similar to what the CMV vaccine is doing. And so an argument can be made and is being made, it's a hypothesis, that what the CMV vaccine does in this prevention setting is not kill, but like ART, prevent infection, prevent latency. Okay, so the, the, the argument then is, of course, is that even this particular vaccine at the end of the day is not gonna be very good at, at necessarily clearing the reservoir, but, but controlling the reservoir, which is, I'm gonna argue is what we actually mainly need. Um, and I would also argue that, um, um, and there's a series of studies of a group has been in, that uh, when you look in the blood of elite controllers, you find all this evidence of these very cytotoxic T cells we think are killers, but when you actually look in the tissues of elite controllers, what, you're, what we're finding um, are that the phenotypes of these T cells are less cytotoxic and more along the lines of perhaps controlling spread through cytokines and so forth. So this has led to the hypothesis, I think, that um, if we need a reduction of the reservoir during ART, and we do, probably the best way of going about that and where most people are going uh, is um, uh, with, with, with effector processes that are very good at killing, ADCC, uh, uh, antibodies, NK cells, and so forth. Uh, but if we need long-term control of spread, a therapy vaccine, in theory, should be able to do that if we come up with the right vaccine. Okay, so I think, um, I think at least for me, going through this exercise, I'm thinking very differently about what we need during ART, killing, probably not therapeutic vaccine from the data I've seen so far, but decades and decades of control, which will be essential, is where I think we're going to need a therapeutic vaccine. Now, we've tried. Tony Fauci's group uh, uh, has, did a very elegant clinical trial, randomized study, very beautiful. Um, it's published in Science Translational Medicine, took a very promising therapeutic vaccine, had a placebo, gave uh, uh, randomized patients, stopped therapy, absolutely no difference. And this um, uh, joins a long, long list of failures. So why are, these, um, why are these things failing? And what are we gonna do about it? So I would argue that if you look in elite controllers, post-treatment controllers, even cancer, when you have rare disease like this that you wanna control with the immune system, you need three things. You need a low disease burden for the cancer or the reservoir in treated patients, low levels of chronic inflammation, which can have an immunoregulatory negative effect on any vaccine, probably gonna be necessary. And of course you need an effective, uh, probably CD T cell response uh, that resides in tissues where the virus is, is effective, targets susceptible epitopes. Um, so then um, um, what, what more precisely are the problems that have failed? I would say there are four major ones. One, the vaccines that we've used have all been stolen from the prevention world and preventative vaccines probably differ than cure vaccines, a separate talk. 
So we may need to be thinking about whether or not the therapeutic vaccine should be specific to the needs of a curologist rather than a prevention doc. Um, and there are specific issues with the way these, these vaccines work in therapy. There's the, these pre-existing immunodominant responses that seem to come back. There's CTL escape and so forth. And of course, there are these other issues, inflammation, high vertus burden, and the issue of these tissue sanctuaries. With regard to the vaccines, uh, there's a very, very robust portfolio of studies right now moving in the clinic. Uh, one thing that people are doing is we're trying to shift the immunodominance to these highly conserved areas. Our group is working with Barbara Felber to develop a therapeutic vaccine in the clinic. Uh, we've also began to work with um, Lewis Picker uh, and Betty Korber uh, to develop an RNA vaccine approach, perhaps with the epigraph. Other groups um, have already presented clinical data, uh, um, uh, ALIX uh, and the UK group. Uh, looking at this. There are multiple groups now that are beginning to look at looking at these highly conserved areas. So the inserts are important. Um, the vectors are important. Uh, we've seen some success with dendritic cells. Uh, that may be less uh, scalable than other approaches. Uh, the CMV vaccine remains very exciting. Uh, and in the, in the vaccine world in general, there's a tremendous amount of excitement and interest for the RNA vaccine approach, um, which we've been working with in, in the monkey model. And to be honest, I think may end up being one of the more exciting uh, ways to go about dealing with HIV cure and the reservoir. Adjuvants are going to be important. Um, uh, Dan Baruch, uh, in, a, in a study that um, really actually, I think, generalized this, generalized, uh, uh, generalized this stimulated this field um, uh, with a uh, AD26 MVA uh, with Gilead GS9620 um, TLR7 agonist in, in that study and the group that got the combination of the vaccine and the adjuvant uh, a handful of animals became elite controllers. First proof of concept in a monkey model. Um, finally, and this leads to the next talk, uh, I don't think if you take a conserved element vaccine, you boost it, you give it the best adjuvant, you may, you may cure monkeys, but I don't think anyone in this room thinks we're gonna cure uh, people with that approach. It's gonna have to be more complicated. I actually think at this point in the cure epidemic, we need to be thinking in the cure agenda, we need to be thinking about these combination approaches. Uh, some promising studies have already been done, and, and Sarah Fiddler is going to present um, um, results from the really first well-done uh, randomized clinical trial of a combination vaccine approach versus placebo uh, as soon as I shut up, which will be in a minute. Um, and I'll say what we're doing. Uh, what we are doing um, with AMFAR Institute support, um, and um, we've been given the charge from AMFAR to, to, to develop an approach that we think is going to be potentially effective. We are working with the NCI group, Barbara Felber, to, to vaccinate patients who are on ART with a therapeutic vaccine against conserved areas. We're boosting that. We're going to follow that, uh, follow that up with, act, with exposure to a, a, a vaccine adjuvant that will be given in combination with BNABs um, uh, to reduce the reservoir, stop therapy, and see what happens. And the study is a very complicated study involving eight different partners, uh, but it's actually gone quite remarkably well. We hope to be in clinic in a couple months. So with that, um, uh, I just want to acknowledge my friends and uh, uh, supporters from the DARE Collaboratory, where a lot of the basic science and the CNV work has been done, uh, and also um, uh, my uh, team, mostly at UCSF, from the Amphar Institute of HIV Cure Research, which are supporting that clinical trial that I just mentioned. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We are going to our next speaker, Dr. Sarah Fiedler. Um, she's going to talk us about a randomized controlled trial comparing the impact of antiretroviral therapy with a kick and kill approach to ART alone on HIV reservoir in individuals with primary HIV infection, river trial. Thank you. Thanks, Steve, for the introduction, and thanks for the organisers for giving us the opportunity as a late breaker to present the primary results of the RIVER trial. So RIVER, as you've heard, was a two-arm proof-of-concept randomised trial. Um, there was no placebo, in fact. It was ART alone versus the combination intervention. And I'm speaking on behalf of a large team of people who've done a lot of work to get this trial going, funded, and um, finalised. So a disclosure is that the interventions we used in the trial were raltegravir and varinostat uh, donated to us from MSD and part of one of the vaccines was part owned by GSK. 
So the approach which many in the room have heard about is the concept we're trying to test was kick and kill. In order to achieve a cure for HIV, any intervention has got to limit or remove the size of these latently infected cells, the so-called reservoir. The approach under investigation in this trial is the kick and kill strategy that's been described before by Steve and others. Essentially, in order to eliminate latently infected cells that harbour integrated HIV DNA, a combination approach is required. The first is to activate these latently infected cells to express viral proteins, which are then uh, recognised by the HIV-specific immune system and, in theory, are removed from the reservoir by being killed. And in the context of antiretroviral therapy, any full viral replication and release of virions is protected from infecting any uninfected CD4 cells by, by the treatment being there. So we've previously shown in the SPARTAC trial that measuring the size of the HIV reservoir using an imperfect tool, which is the peripheral blood total HIV DNA measurement per CD4 T cell, was a good predictor of the time to viral rebound when antiretroviral therapy was stopped. And in this trial, people were randomly allocated to an arm to stop treatment. So for this reason, we selected this as a reproducible biomarker of the primary study endpoint. So the river study design was pre treated individuals with primary HIV infection. So these were not acute FEBIG1 stage individuals largely, but they were people with known previous negative tests and became positive within only several months of that test, all of whom started immediate treatment. The kick we used in this stu study was the oral virinostat, an HDAC inhibitor. And the kill is a prime boost vaccine, which is similar to the one that was used in the Barcelona trial, um, BCN01, BCN02. Uh, the design is a randomized one-to-one -one comparison where the, um, in the control arm had antiretroviral therapy on its own. And as I've mentioned, the primary study endpoint was a total HIV DNA in peripheral blood CD4 cells at weeks 18 and six, 16 and 18 post-randomization. So here's the river design in a bit more detail. Individuals with, with confirmed recent HIV infection were enrolled. They were initiated on immediate antiretroviral therapy, which included an integrase inhibitor. So the vast majority of people started on a four-drug combination of Truvada, Bucidurinavir, and Raltegravir because we didn't have their genotype back and we wanted viral suppression to be quick. Um, upon confirmation of an undetectable HIV viral load, usually at week 22 or prior to randomization, individuals are randomized on a one-to-one -one basis to either remain on their antiretroviral therapy or to commence the intervention with a vaccination with the prime and then the boost eight weeks later, and then to take 10 total doses of varinostat, which was given every 72 hours. Um, and this dosing schedule is uh, based on data from MSD and has been published in that paper I referenced at the bottom here. And then the primary study outcome was 18, 16 and 18 weeks after total HIV DNA. So just to, to highlight that the people that have had their primary endpoint have actually only been living with HIV for around about one year by the time we measured their reservoirs. Here's a list of the primary outcomes I've mentioned to you already, um, and the analysis was between the two study arms at a combination of those two time points. And then we have multiple secondary endpoints, but of course the most important is clinical and laboratory adverse events. So this is a summary by arm of the study of the methods by which people were diagnosed with primary infection. You can see that the vast majority, about two two-thirds of them had an antibody positive test already and were diagnosed using our Public Health England, which is like CDC, um, routine testing using a RETA test algorithm. And um, there were about 17 participants who had evidence of very acute infection where they had not yet developed an antibody prior to starting antiretroviral therapy. This is the uh, description of our participants at randomization, which just to point out again, is not the time that they were first infected, but the time that they had an undetectable viral load. At this time, most people had been on treatment, if you look at the bottom line, for around about 28 weeks. The CD4 count, as you would expect, was good. Most people, almost everybody had an undetectable HIV viral load. And for regulatory reasons, um, most all our participants were men, and most of them were men who have sex with men. So um, 
When evaluating the robustness of any clinical trial, it's important to demonstrate the number of study participants with data that are contributing to the primary endpoint. We saw the most remarkable commitment in this study, with no loss to follow-up and only a few missed study visits at all, more in the ART-only arm. All 60 participants attended and have available samples that contributed to the study primary endpoint at weeks 16 and 18 after randomization, as you can see here. And this is a tribute to the amazing engagement and passion of our participants. So importantly first, was it safe? This is one of the key outcomes of any novel intervention, particularly in the context we are all working where antiretroviral therapy is remarkably well tolerated and safe. We show that although there were, uh, there were many reported adverse events, and we also solicited adverse events following the intervention in particular, we did see more adverse events reported in the vaccine in varinostat arm, but the vast majority were mild and moderate and all resolved. The intervention did no harm. So now I'm going to show you the primary endpoint. This figure shows the quantified total HIV DNA along the y-axis and the time points where this was measured along the x-axis. Each dot represents quantification of HIV DNA, HIV DNA for each study participant. And you can clearly see that there's a significant de decline in HIV DNA from the time of enrollment, which was the time of their diagnosis of acute infection, and the study endpoint almost 46 weeks later. The study presented here the data presented here, sorry, is the combined total HIV DNA values over time for all study participants from both arms. Without the randomization, we would be able to say that we saw a significant effect in terms of change in HIV DNA. However, for this figure and the rest of the presentation, the blue, blue represents the antiretroviral therapy with the vaccine in Varinostat, and the red is antiretroviral therapy alone. And you can see that when broken down by study arm, it's clear that there is no significant difference at any time point between total HIV DNA um, for, for all our participants across the arms. So now to talk about the secondary endpoints. We have not completed all of the secondary endpoints of this study yet, but this is a viral outgrowth assay which is performed in Andrew Lever's lab in Cambridge in the UK. And it was performed at baseline, which is also randomization, and then post uh, randomization at week 16. The assay, shows, oops, sorry, the assay shows a very similar finding to the total HIV DNA, where you can see here that um, the viral outgrowth at baseline, as one would expect, is the same. But similarly, at week, 20, at week 16, between the two arms of the study, again, viral outgrowth was the same. There was no significant difference between the arms. So why did this happen or not happen? The HIV-specific T-cell responses, did the vaccines work? Did they do what we had hoped they would do? So in Professor Lucy Dorrell's lab in Oxford, they have done intracellular cytokine staining and uh, also a novel uh, viral inhibition assay in vitro, taking cells from our participants from, again, both arms of the study. We show here the HIV-specific uh, CD4 T-cell responses in the vaccine and varinostat arm in the blue again, and the antiretroviral therapy arm in the red. And again, you can see here that there is a significant difference post-vaccination uh, at weeks 9 and weeks 12, as we would expect um, in the vaccinated arm compared to the people with antiretroviral therapy alone. Similarly here, you can see for CD8 T cell responses, again, there is a significant difference between the antiretroviral therapy um, arm alone, the red, and the vaccine and Brinistat arm, the blue. But did these T cells work in a test tube? What was their functional assays? And this is a, a response um, in a, a CD8 killing assay. And again, the blue, although there's wide confidence intervals, there is a significant preservation of HIV-specific CD8-mediated killing for those individuals who were vaccinated in the blue compared to people who had just antiretroviral therapy alone in the red. And in fact, it appears that with time on suppressive therapy, the function of the CD8 T cells to uh, inhibit uh, virus in an, in an assay declines for those people who are just on treatment. So did the Varinostat do what we expected it to do? And we measured this in 22 participants out of the 30 who were randomized to the vaccine and Varinostat arm. And this was measured as a acetylation inhibition at two hours post-dosing. 
and we, sh we saw an increase um, of a factor of 3.2 in acetylation change um, in, compared to the pre and post Vrinostat dosing uh, with no difference between study visits. In total, if you remember, the participants took 10 doses of Vrinostat. So this is on a level with the uh, inhibition that has been reported by previous groups who've also worked with Vrinostat, and they have shown in their studies that this correlated with viral transcription. We have yet to analyze this, the data um, that will look at this in more detail from our study, but we anticipate that Vrinostat is behaving as we had expected it to. We also have a gut sub-study, which is done by a colleague, John Thornhill, which is um, where participants, five people from each of the study arms, had a uh, colonoscopy with terminal ileum and rectal biopsies, again, for measurement of their immune responses and total HIV DNA, and we will present those results uh, later. So to summarize, the interventions used in this trial did no harm, an important finding. We showed no significant difference in measures of HIV DNA at weeks 16 and 18 combined post-randomization between the arms. We showed outstanding commitment from our participants with no loss to follow-up and 97% adhered to their intervention. Varinostat significantly increased histone deacetylation and the antiretroviral with vaccine and Varinostat significantly stimulated HIV-specific CD4 and CD8 T-cell responses when compared with controls who had antiretroviral therapy alone. This is actually an important finding because some of the data has suggested that Varinostat, in fact, may be toxic to T-cell function, and in fact, we have not shown any evidence of that by the assays we've used. I feel like this study highlights the importance of using a control <coughs> arm. The result is definitive, but it's disappointing, and at least we have now been able to answer that question. So people have asked us, does this, this study show that the approach to kick and kill um, is not going to work. And I think, to be very clear, all we can say from the data that you have just seen is that as measured by our endpoint of total HIV DNA, approximately one year after primary infection in people on antiretroviral therapy, which is hugely successful, this did not show a significant difference between the arms. I don't think this means, and I don't think that would be the take home, that this approach is the incorrect approach. And of course, it may be that the re latency reversing agent we used here is not potent enough. And there are, as you've heard, many new agents under study and investigation coming forward. And it may be that the vaccination we used was actually not uh, recognizing the correct epitopes that are expressed on reservoir cells, which again, as Steve's already explained, um, may be different from those epitopes that have been used to generate these preventative vaccines. And we will present more detailed laboratory research um, to better understand the results we've found so far. So like everybody, I would really like to thank everybody who's been in, involved in, in this trial. It's been an enormous uh, collaboration of many people. In particular, I'd like to thank all the River Study participants, uh, my co-investigator and co-PI, John Freighter, who has done all the laboratory work in Oxford, um, the River statisticians, Abdul and, and Wolfgang, and all the study investigators, both who've run the lab work, who've helped manage the trial and who've helped recruit and manage the patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have now time for some questions. Um, really elegant study, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, question, because Steve brought up inflammation in his talk. Uh, something we're all interested in. So what about inflammatory markers and were they changed at all at baseline through the two groups and would that explain some of the findings as well? So we haven't measured them yet. That's on our to-do list, um, both sort of cytokines and also activation markers on, on the T cells. So I can't answer the question, but it is something we want to look at. Right, and you're also going to be looking at the exhaustion like a PD-1, TIM-3 to see if indeed that was affected by the outcome, so you don't have that data either. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, Casper Rox from the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. Really nice talk. Um, I was wondering if you have if you had any pharmacokinetic data as well. No, so, so Merck have been doing the assays on Varinostat because they've got all those set up and they've shared the one about the histone deacetylase inhibition, but we haven't got any of the other data yet. But the dosing schedule we used in this is exactly the same as uh, the Margolis lab have used already. 
So if you remember, Sharon Lewin did a study where they used 400 milligrams of, of varinostat daily, and it appears that that is actually... The, the toxicities they saw were, were quite significant. And then uh, Nancy Archon's work that has done data to show, which was published, I, I gave the reference, to suggest that the... That every third day dosing is sufficient to, to cause the same or similar effects with much less toxicity, which is what we used and what we saw. Steve. Uh, Sarah, you, so um, we don't really have a good reservoir. We don't have a good measurement for the reservoir, and we don't really know how to measure the immunocor immunologic correlates of control. Yeah. So you have no idea whether this worked or not. The only, <laughs> the only way it could have worked. Um, you, you could have generated these, you know, these great T cells against conserved areas. This is one of the first uh, studies to look at these conserved um, regions in a, in, a, in a very potent uh, uh, vaccine in the setting of early HIV infection. Um, I think you are obliged to at least strongly consider, in order to learn as much as you can from all these participants who put themselves through this, to do a treatment interruption. I think not doing one would be um, a mistake. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> so when you say obliged, do you mean morally, ethically, or scientifically? <laughs> I, I, anyway, no, I'll, it, I'll pass it, it. An argument could be made that, that yes, the, you put these individuals at high risk, not high risk, but some risk, and they put a lot of time into it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I do think you're, you're obliged to the degree that you can do it safely, learn as much as you can, yeah. and answer the question. And so I'm not saying that you are ethically obliged, but I am saying that there is a pathway forward there that, that, with rationale that, that you, you would learn something. Yeah, no, I'm joking. I, I agree, and we've, we've discussed this, as you well know, and, and we had a very interesting discussion on Saturday at the, at the Cure with the community um, about, about how to do an in, a treatment inter interruption, who should do it, and when we should do it. And I think... If you go back to the data I showed of, of the Spartac, we, we know that the levels of total DNA with all the caveats and problems with that assay have overall predicted time to rebound. So we could, if, if I can show that, or you remember the slide where there's a big range, in fact, of total DNA, both at the beginning and at the end. And it may be that we can select people to interrupt. Oh, no, no, no. You but want to treat, interrupt no, 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 everybody. No, but you're, the more interesting data are the immunology data not the DNA data. So this is different than Spartac in that you have very potent immunologic responses, which may overpower those, that DNA effect. Mm -hmm. So that's why this is different. No, no, I, I know it's different from Spartac. What I'm trying to say is that we know that the DNA predicts rebound. And what I feel on the, on the patient side, and I'd be very interested if there's any people living with HIV in the, com in the audience, what they feel, is that do we want to have another study that's just going to show a whole bunch of rapidly rebounding individuals. I, I feel at the moment the data we have, and there is a lot more data coming from John's lab that he may want to comment on, that might help us to de decide who is going to interrupt or you know, select people rather than just interrupt therapy in 60 people and get another graph to put to your, to your list. Let's take a vote. <laughs> Mr. Brown? I wanted to say that I agree that um, uh, treatment interruption should be done if it's the patient's will. I, I chose to interrupt my, my treatment, and it worked, and I'm cured. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it should pa be the patient's will. And, uh, um, uh, and, but uh, there should definitely be scientific grounds behind that to, um, to make the decision, help, help the patient make the decision. Cipriano Martin is, I, I agree, it needs to be an opt-in. Mm -hmm. Let them opt-in. Yeah, I agree. There's no harm in letting them opt-in. And I think given the commitment that so many of them have actually engaged with, I think you'll find that most of them will. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm agreeing that I'm probably the one that's more concerned on, and conservative than most of the participants in the study who have had the most remarkable commitment to, to be part of this. And just one other question, uh, how does this uh, going forward, are you going to be thinking about TLR agonism or other more effective reactivation strategies that come along? I'm, I'm just hoping this doesn't uh, dampen yeah. uh, excitement for, for those future uh, and newer compounds. Yes, and I think these individuals are in a unique position, and I suppose that's the concern scientifically about interrupting them now. Perhaps now is not quite the right time in that they've only, uh, many of them have only actually been living with HIV for perhaps just over a year or two. And 
it might be that we want to limit the size of the reservoir and then revaccinate them and then perhaps give another activating agent that's something different that's more potent. Do you plan to sequence the virus to see how many of them are intact? Because there's this whole debate about whether the outgrowth or the DNA and the overrepresentation of the defective virions. Mm. And since your vaccine presumably is going after the replication competent component, yep. if in, abs in, in lieu of the treatment interruption dialogue, do you have any plans to actually get to that point? Yes, yeah, so I don't know if John, you want to speak, but we are going to sequence, certainly before we interrupt. Okay, thank you. And we are now officially on time. Uh, so, you know, wink, wink, right? Uh, next is uh, Anna Marie Vensing uh, from Utrecht, who will be talking on dominant HIV DNA populations present in different T cell subsets before stem cell transplantation persist in tissue early after transplantation with CCR5 Delta 32 stem cells. So, very happy to be here in Amsterdam. We have one person formerly living with HIV in the room. I hope we will have next conference more of you, Timothy. Um, so, these are my disclosures. And I'm going to talk about HIV and stem cell transplantation. People living with HIV have a higher risk for hematological malignancies such as AML, MDS, and lymphoma. And there is, unfortunately, a lower overall survival rate after stem cell transplantation for these conditions as compared to a matched control of HIV-negative patients. And Timothy Brown, here present in the room, the so-called Berlin patient, was cured from both AML and HIV infection after SCT. And I think we all know that this cure was very, um, uh, of Timothy got a very uh, special transplantation. The cells that he received with the stem cell transplantation had a genetic defect. A, a, a base pair deletion of 32 uh, actually resulting in no expression of the CCR5 co-receptor on his cells. And later on, Monique and Yuri showed us that actually his virus that was present before the stem cell transplantation was not able to use any other co-receptors and was completely dependent of the CCR5 receptor. So these two facts actually uh, suggest that this is the reason that Timothy was cured. But there are other factors to take into account that puzzle me and also others I know. Before the stem cell transplantation took place, there was already a treatment interruption. And at that time, there was a high rebound of the virus. So Timothy had virus that could rebound. And then the stem cell uh, procedure was performed, but it actually took two procedures to cure Timothy. And in between those two procedures, his own cells with the CCR5 receptor were circulating, but he was off therapy and there was no rebound of HIV. And then he got the second one and got cured of the AML. So it seems there may be playing something more than just the Delta 32 homozygous status of the donor cells and the absence of viruses that could use other co-receptors. So was it maybe the viral rebound that primed his immune system before the stem cell transplantation? Was it the immune suppressive treatment with ATG levels? Was it the total body irradiation that he had? Or the serious graft versus host disease that he suffered from? Or maybe his own CCR5 heterozygous state, and because he himself has partly the gene effect in his DNA, and this may have resulted in a lower DNA reservoir before the stem cell transplantation. We don't know. There are other patients who have become well known because of stem cell transplantation. And for instance, the Essen patient, and Monique <laughs> will talk about that in the next presentation. We have the Minnesota patient who also had the stem cell transplantation with the Delta 32 homozygous donor cells. He had, was a child, successful engraftment, but unfortunately died because of graft versus host relatively early after the stem cell transplantation. And HIV DNA was detected in tissues in this patient. And then we had Timothy Hendricks' famous patient, the Boston patients, who were actually already a couple of years after a stem cell transplantation, but they received wild-type donor cells. So these still had the CCR5 receptor expressing on the surface. They had successful engraftment, and if I understand right, uh, Timothy, they had actually graft versus host, but primarily of the skin. Yeah. 
And then um, there's no HCV detected in blood, as, as Steve already showed, using lots of cells and in the rectal mucosa. And after um, ATI, there was unfortunately a viral rebound after 12 and 32 weeks. And it's unknown which reservoirs fueled the viral rebound. But what is nicely described is that the rebounding virus very much looks like the virus that was present before stem cell transplantation. So we want to learn more about this, and that's why Javier martinez Picado, sitting there on the front row, and I, uh, with the help of AMFAR, actually established a consortium. It's an international collaboration to guide and investigate the potential of HIV cure in HIV-infected patients who require uh, allogenetic stem cell transplantation for hematological disorders. And the first aim is to assist clinicians who are involved in this procedure. The second aim is more scientifically to understand the underlying biological processes leading to viral reservoir reduction and potential remission. So currently we have 37 patients registered in the consortium from nine different countries. I say registered and not included. It's not a clinical trial at this phase. It's an observational cohort in which we sample uh, those people. There are 30 patients uh, transplanted. The mean follow-up is 88, seven days. We have 12 patients who unfortunately deceased after stem cell transplantation. It's a bit of a survival benefit, therefore it's a bit higher than, uh, the survival is a bit higher than in literature. And we have 12 patients who are beyond the second year post-SCT. And a couple of these patients have been really well mapped, and I will come back to that at the end of my presentation. In all those patients, if we make a comparison to patients who have been treated, the relevance has fallen off. This is a well-known graph of Besson, published in CID. These are patients treated, and what happened actually is that after initial treatment, you see a little bit of decrease of the viral reservoir taken as total uh, DNA, but then after time, it stabilizes. Here for 10 years, we also know that it happens for 20 years. Now we're looking to the patients in IC stem. In blue, you see the post-SCT viral reservoir management uh, measurements. And what you can see is actually all the patients, independent whether they had a donor with a Delta 32 defect or just a wild type donor, everybody, we see the reservoir going down dramatically. So I take out one patient, patient five, because he was the Utrecht patient. Uh, the methods that we used is phenotypic and genotypic co-receptor tropism anal analysis. We did quantification of the HIV reservoir with DDPCR and qPCR, and viral characterization using deep sequencing of PBMCs and CD4 T cell subsets. Um, single copy assay was performed on plasma to look at very low levels of HIV RNA. And post-SCT, we um, looked at the viral dynamics. Unfortunately, this patient died. And so that gave us also the opportunity to look post-mortem. And we did that again with, with uh, digital PCR and deep sequencing. This is a nice graph from the Athena cohort. In the Netherlands, almost all patients are included in this cohort, and it gives you an overview of people who are treated over 20 years. And this patient started therapy in 1998 with an unboosted uh, protease inhibitor, which was not completely successful, interrupted therapy, and then got a more extensive therapy and was actually suppressed, but had a little blip just before SCT. So he had a stem cell transplantation because he suffered from MDS. It was in 2012, and we used a cord uh, blood transplant with a third-party donor. The third-party donor is a donor without the homozygous delta-32 uh, defect, and this is a bridge to allow more time to, for the cord blood to, um, to populate the bone marrow. And the cord blood was delta-32 homozygous for CCR5. And antiretal therapy was not interrupted. So here you can see in red the pro-viral DNA was uh, highly present. In, um, the patient had undetectable viral load at the time point of SCT, but there were like 15 copies with the, a single copy assay, the very sensitive viral load assay, and a moderate amount of CD4 cells. There's a subtype B virus that he had, CCR5 tropic with the FPR of 88.4. That means we are quite uh, convinced that this is a CCR5 using virus. Then we looked at um, different pre-SCT at different T cell subsets. And what you can see over the whole range, most of the virus had a very high FPR. That means they're all CCR5 tropic. <coughs> 
then we looked into these T cell subsets whether we could find HIV DNA. This was pre SCT, and as you can see, there's an abundance of HIV DNA present in all T cell subsets that we looked into. And the SCT took place, and we saw the, the viral reservoir going down, also the RNA, and then the patient had full gymorism. And what we saw was the DNA stayed uh, undetectable, but we saw a little bit of uh, increase in the uh, HIV RNA, about eight copies. We do not know, really know whether this was viral production or still replication. And then, unfortunately, the patient died. We are very happy that the family allowed autopsy. They did not allow autopsy of the brain, but furthermore, but, um, we could um, sample a lot of other tissues. And also the really important reservoir in the terminal ileum. And you can see that here, that actually indeed, most of the HIV DNA at this time point, relatively early after SCT, is, is in, in this part of the body. And then we sequenced those viruses with deep sequencing. And what we actually found is that all these variants that we found in the tissues were actually exactly similar to the ones that we saw before the stem cell transplantation in the PBMCs. So in conclusion, after stem cell transplantation, a sharp decline in HIV DNA is observed to be low levels of detection actually in all the patients um, independent of the CCR5 uh, presence uh, of the CCR5 gene defect or not. In patient 5, in the neutropenic phase, early post-SCT HIV DNA could not longer be detected in PBMCs. In contrast, dominant HIV dominate DNA populations persisted in tissues, indicating that tissue reservoirs may play an important role as long-standing viral reservoirs. And sequences of the viruses obtained from post-mortem biopsies actually very, were very similar to what was seen before stem cell transplantation in the plasma and don't indicate immunization or viral evolution, even though we found a little bit of HIV RNA. So what are the future directions of the IC stem? We're going to focus on those who survived. And we have a number who is actually beyond two years of stem cell transplantation and have an undetectable viral load and undetectable DNA concentration in blood and in isolated T cells from other tissues. I'll show you a graph with seven patients who have been really well mapped, in which six are actually, we cannot find in six of those, any HIV using either single copy assay total HIV DNA with large input. We do leukophoresis in these patients, not in the QFOA, and also not in the T cells uh, isolated from ileum and the lymph nodes, and neither in CSF. And these patients, with the help of AMPAR, who's going to support our analytical trial um, protocol, we're going to start with an intervention with uh, analytical treatment interruption soon. So I would like to acknowledge, of course, Javier, uh, as co-PI of this consortium, but also uh, the others that are really active, um, like Monique Nijhuis, Asher Sazier Sirion, José Diaz Martin, Miquon, um, Gero Hutter, and um, Julian Schulte Suvis, Johanna Eberhardt, and Maria Salgado, who did a lot of the work uh, uh, presented here as well. And then all the centers that are involved, uh, from Germany to Italy to Spain, and um, other centers who are not going to be included in this trial, but probably in, or maybe in the next one that we're uh, envisioning. And this is our group in Utrecht, with Mar uh, Monique and me in the core. And here you see Kobus, who did a lot of the work. Kobus Bosman, a PhD student, and our wonderful technicians, Doreen de Jong and Pauline Schipper, who are actually, without them, we would be nowhere. Thank you. Henry, can, can I start off with a question? Interesting case. Um, were you able or planning on doing any uh, chimerism in those different tissues at, at the week? Because it's a fairly early week stage. So, for example, the terminal ileum with uh, very large, uh, high levels of, of DNA, for example. It would be interesting to see how that correlates with uh, how many donor versus recipient cells, because it can take... Uh, you know, months or so for it to kind of clear out, and depending how much graft versus host effects, uh, beneficial effects, and case cell activity, things like that. Is that is that in the works to kind of see how? I think it would be it would really really interesting to see if it correlates with how many uh, residual recipient cells are left in the. I totally agree. We did that in patient 11 from the Netherlands, actually a patient from Amsterdam, and there we saw that the gymorism in the tissue is very much delayed. So uh, that could uh, definitely um, explain the presence of HVDNA. It would be nice to correlate. 
And this patient, we did not get permission of the donor, but we hope that some publicity maybe, you know, uh, convince people that this is really worthwhile to try. So another reason to present the case. Sharon. Thanks, Tim. Beautiful talk, Anne-Marie. Um, I was wondering whether you measured the CD4 percentage both in blood and in tissue, because you could probably model what you'd expect to find, and given the really high frequency of total CD4 in tissue, you know, this might not be surprising. It may not be telling you about compartmentalisation. You could model it. And also I noticed that in, cause in the blood you just looked at PBMC and someone that was neutropenic, you may have had very few CD4 T cells there. Yeah, I agree. It's of course our post-transplant with the low uh, presence of virus really difficult to do any reliable assessments in the T cell subsets. The immunology actually, I think we will hear about that in the future from us, yeah. yeah. And is this the same rate of survival between patients that had been uh, uh, transplanted with CCR5 Delta 32 and what type? Yeah, there had been, I think, based on a review that Giro uh, Hooters um, described, a fear of higher mortality of patients who received the Delta 32 homozygous transplantation. We have not really seen that, but it's a low number. And I think we have in the cohort a survival benefit because we also allow um, it, um, uh, inclusion or registration after stem cell transplantation. And that's why our figures are generally lower than in literature of uh, mortality. So, Anne-Marie, do you, um, First. quick question, but so we've, we have some experience, not tremendous, about these low, low, low reservoir post-transplant CCR5 uh, wild-type situations. It seems unlikely you're going to get rid of every single virus. So my obvious question based on my talk is why are you not giving them an immune system that will help? Well, I think two things. I think um, what we have really shown, I think that's for the first time in all those patients at the ileum, we also cannot find any HIV DNA. I think most of the studies really focused on other parts of the intestine. Um, I agree with you. I think we already discussed it also at the, at the workshop Saturday that um, immune system may definitely, uh, the own patient's immune system may definitely play a role. So we're not planning to do an ATI without intervention. Oh, you're not? Okay. Okay, and next I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Andrew Wong, uh, who is a PhD student uh, at, uh, I believe, the University of New South Wales, is that correct? Yep, or, yeah, I'm fantastic. at the Kirby Institute. Uh, excellent, so if anybody's looking for a postdoc in the near future, <laughs> uh, in gene therapy. Uh, and uh, uh, Andrew will be talking about uh, modular gene therapy vectors for gene therapy cure in resting immune cells. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. So this presentation is largely going to concern the uh, development of a gene therapy vector that we hope can be translated into a functional cure of HIV disease. And we're quite passionate about a HIV cure um, using gene therapy, primarily because this allows us to recapitulate what is essentially uh, the, the phenotype in the Berlin patient. Uh, but in addition to that, it allows us to potentially also silence the HIV reservoir. And perhaps um, through other technologies, perhaps we can start to erode the HIV reservoir as well. So I, I know that uh, um, gene therapy can be a, a very exciting yet controversial topic. Um, but perhaps uh, the reason why we don't see it in, in, in the clinic and uh, perhaps why we don't see it being persistent, um, as Professor Deeks has, has, um, has said in his introduction talk, is because of the way that we currently facilitate gene therapy or the way that uh, we, we want to do it. And uh, the current way, uh, the modus operandi, is currently to expand your cells, activate them, and then go in, transduce them. So in, in this way, we are modifying the cell uh, arguably quite extensively and uh, not modifying the vector. So we're modifying the cells, not the vector, um, and we think that that's probably uh, one way in which we can look at gene therapy's approach. So how else can we do it? Perhaps look at resting cells. Uh, resting cells, you get a higher quality product, and in addition to that, since we're not preactivating these cells, we're using less viral inocula, and uh, this has implications on increasing activity, uh, increasing access, sorry, uh, down the track. So this is something that we're quite interested in. So as I mentioned before, as I alluded to, it's mainly in the vector. 
And current vector strategies don't play very nicely with resting T cells. It's a, it's a problem with getting delivery into resting T cells. So the cellular membrane doesn't allow traditional vectors, um, it doesn't allow them entry. And in addition to that, if you can get entry, then you have further implications in getting that integrated, um, getting your protection modules integrated into the genome and actually having a protective effect. And this is because you have restriction factors such as SAMHD1 that act as gatekeepers inside the nucleus. So if we want to be able to dance with uh, resting cells and we want to be able to uh, deliver gene therapy to these cells, we need to really rethink the way that we uh, design these vectors. So let's talk firstly about targeting these cells in the first place. The, what, what we did was that we had a development pipeline to um, isolate and identify, CD, uh, identify envelopes that could deliver really, really high efficiency into, these, into the cell type. And this has led us to identify a lentivirus envelope, kind of makes sense because lentiviruses, especially HIV, gets into resting cells or gets into CD4 positive cells pretty well. And with this lead envelope, we can get into a large majority of these naive cells, and as you can see here, it's uh, quite a large proportion of your circulating T cells as indicated by the size, and we get into um, these naive cells, which I think is important because they are quite stem-like in, uh, in, in their phenotype. We can also do this with very low CD4 dependency as, um, as measured by a CD4 um, assay. Um, in addition to that, if you don't want to use integrative gene therapy, if you want to just deliver protein or if you want to deliver some sort of expression module uh, that doesn't have to be integrated, you can do that with this lead envelope uh, with really high efficiency. So um, it, it has multiple applications down the track. So I think that um, with this envelope, we've been able to solve the problem of, of um, viral delivery to this really difficult cell type. Um, but what about getting your, your gene cassettes integrated into these cells? Well, um, because you have this uh, restriction factor called SAMHD1. Fortunately for us, there is a accessory protein called VPX uh, that is expressed by HIV2 in some lineages of SIV that can get into, uh, that can clear out SAMHD1 and uh, allow us to essentially um, increase the delivery outcomes using these viral vectors. So what we did was um, we looked at the literature and it, there only turns out to be a handful of VPX variants out there that have been used in a gene therapy sort of context. And we know that there is a, a large number of VPX variants that are out there. So what we did was that we took uh, a whole bunch of VPX variants that have been published. We also sprinkled in some unpublished variants in here as well. And what we did was that we found that there were a few clusters and what we did was we took a number of uh, variants from these clusters in order to see how they may enhance uh, gene transduction in, uh, in resting T cells and also in macrophages. So looking at immune cells, uh, primary immune cells as a whole. And what we found was that uh, there were indeed quite a number of VPX variants that could enhance in primary cells. But a few things uh, were quite startling. Firstly, you have a little area here where the level of enhancement in T cells seems to be quite higher compared to your macrophages. So this kind of uh, alludes to the potential of uh, T cell tropic VPX variants. But importantly for our case, we've been able to find a, a variant that enhanced just as well as it does in T cells as it does in macrophages. And uh, this is a, a, a pretty uh, cool sort of uh, variant here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about it, uh, mainly because it has given us uh, insight into how VPX works and how it m can be harnessed and used to um, enhance gene therapy outcomes. So firstly, we looked at the way that 331 works alongside two other variants, uh, one that we know does not enhance and one which is a consensus sequence. And we found that there, is, there are differences in helix one of VPX, which enhances or has some sort of uh, activity to do with SAMHD1 binding. There are also additional mutations in helix three where uh, it facilitates uh, binding with DCAF1, uh, one of the enzymes required to degrade SAMHD1. And with 331, we could get some pretty robust transduction. Uh, we're seeing somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 to 50%. And this is something that is uh, in resting T cells. And we are not using any concentrated lentiviral particles. 
And uh, this is quite unprecedented in the amount of transduction we're receiving using freshly added cells and viral particles that are pretty much just plain old supinated. Um, by our measurements, uh, using uh, sub-T1 cells in order to tighter the, the viral challenge um, particles, it works out to be about 0 0.04. Uh, and so um, sprinkling in some VPX, we managed, to, um, under, we managed to beat our estimations of uh, the actual MOI uh, of 0 0.04. So um, this is uh, possibly one way in which um, 331 works. Uh, another way in which it could work is uh, if we firstly consider the, the regions in which SAMHD1 actually exists. This is a, a macrophage, a primary macrophage, and uh, let's just blow up this, uh, this second image here so we can get a better view. SAMHD1 occurs in three different locations. You have, firstly, you have it in the nucleus, then it's also present at the plasma membrane, and it's also in the cytoplasm. In contrast to a T cell, which is predominantly going to be taken up by the volume of the nucleus, um, these are a, a few differences. Uh, and perhaps why some ver uh, VPX variants work in T cells is because they can traffic towards nucleus quite well. And uh, if, they, if they do, they can deplete the nucleus of SAMHD1. We can increase the amount of DNTPs <coughs> inside the nucleus. And this will uh, f help us facilitate gap and repair and final integration of your gene therapy, uh, of your gene modules. Um, but this is not all rosy. Uh, there are a number of pitfalls. And uh, the first one is that VPX can antagonize the use of NNRTIs and also that of integrase inhibitors. Uh, now, is this necessarily a bad thing? I think that it's not necessarily a bad thing because you don't want to take people off therapy during um, gene therapy. Uh, it's probably best to keep the status quo and uh, if VPX is able to negate the effects of ART, uh, because there's still going to be some residual, residual ART uh, well, compounds lying around, then this will enable us to transduce cells e and not take people off therapy. So it might not necessarily be a, a bad thing. The second pitfall that we identified was that uh, with the use of VPX, and this is in the macaque 239 variant of, uh, of VPX, it seems to open up the window for which cells can be genetically modified. Um, this means that if you were to re-infuse these, these, um, these cells that have been treated with VPX back into the person, potentially um, that puts these cells at risk of transduction by floating HIV. Now, if we were going to use VPX to help transduce CD8 T cells for perhaps CAR T therapy or, or chimeric TCRs, um, this is not a problem because these cells are naturally refractory to infection by HIV-1. But um, for, for, uh, for CD4 T cells, it could be a bit of a problem. Um, the way that we can get around this is by obviously keeping in um, ART, but we've also looked at the bounce back time, the period to bounce back for some of these variants. We found several variants here that allow SAMHD1 to recover a lot quicker than um, pretty much your status quo. And uh, this is a, a mechanism that we are slowly pursuing to determine how it can potentially work. So in short, um, gene therapy as a, as a method to facilitate a functional cure of HIV-1 is something that we're still passionate about, something that we still would like to see being realized in the clinic. And um, the way that we are approaching uh, this sort of approach, uh, the way that we're approaching this is through um, transduction and modification of resting T cells, putting them back into people rather than the use of activated T cells. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, okay. R Rowena's coming to ask a question. <laughs> what kinds of um, gene, uh, what kind of nucleases or whatever have you tried um, making as cargo in these vectors? Uh, what type of um, like things are we trying to integrate? What kind of cargo, nucleases or whatever? Well, have you put anything in there and demonstrated that 
that these yes. modifications that you're making are not yep. affecting your ability to either load them or to get efficacy out of them. Okay, um, I actually prepared a slide for this, so I'm quite <laughs> glad this is us. Uh, so we have, um, <laughs> uh, we, we want to use this projection module called Cal1. It's something that was made by, um, by, by Calimune, and it has a number of different things. Uh, firstly, you have an SHRNA against <laughs> CCR5, and you also have a, a peptide here, C46, which prevents the uh, formation of the six helix bundle and therefore um, entry of, of viral particles. So uh, I want to answer your question in two ways. The first thing is um, what you saw before, that was GFP, uh, because it was a proof of concept. Um, and secondly, we are working with Cal1 now, and we do see a reduction in fusogenic activity of, um, of viruses. So uh, the, I, I'm not sure the exact amount, but it is um, to the point where we're like, oh, that's very interesting. So, yeah. <laughs> so I think I missed this. You said that the VSV glycoprotein is inefficient for uh, uh, quiescent cells, right? Which, for resting T cells, correct. Uh, so you're using HIV envelope, then, native envelope? That's correct. And, and which isolate uh, or type of envelope are you using for this? Uh, this is an X4, uh, this is a dual, sorry, a dual tropic um, envelope that was isolated from spleen tissues. And are you concentrating this vector? Or We're not. You're not. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, hi. So if you use the VPX and it opens a window for TD, TD, TCD4 cells sorry, mm -hmm. to get modified, and you said you cannot take the ARTs away because then they will get infected, right? Uh, but with ARTs, you don't have 100% of stop infection. So if you keep the, the treatment, uh, is there an um, opportunity to close that window so that they don't get infected when you put them in? Because you're going to keep having infection even though you have ART. So, so if I understand your, your question, um, if we keep people on ART and we throw VPX into these cells, um, then there is this open window yeah. uh, in which they, the cells are susceptible to infection. Is that, yeah. and, and, um, and, and your question is whether or not we are concerned with that? Yeah, so if you, if you have that window and yep. ARTs are not suppressing completely, yep. then they will get infected. Definitely. So how would you stop that from happening if you modify those CD4? De definitely. So there, there are a number of ways in which uh, we, can, we can do this. Um, firstly, uh, we could look at um, the use of, of different ART regimens, uh, which is not optimal. Um, but the other way in which we're doing it is, again, looking at uh, VPX variants that allow CMVHD1 to bounce back. And if it's able to do that a lot quicker, then during the process of modifying these cells and getting them ready for transplantation, that window should hopefully close completely. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, our last speaker is Michelle DiMaschio. Evaluation of an antibody to alpha-4, beta-7 in the control of SIV infection. Where is my presentation? Okay, good evening. Um, <clears throat> Thanks to the organizers for giving us this opportunity to present data on our study in which uh, we tested the um, effect of an antibody to alpha-4, beta-7 in controlling HIV infection. So why alpha-4, beta-7? Because it is an important integrin expressed on lymphocytes and responsible for T-cell homing in uh, anatomic compartments like the gut associated with lymphoid tissue when there is a high concentration of the receptor for alpha-4, beta-7, the MADCAM receptor. So it was about 10, 15 years ago that studies were run in vitro and then in vivo to show that uh, CD40 cells with high levels of alpha-4, beta-7 are preferential targets uh, of uh, HIV and HIV during acute infection. So at Emory University, uh, some studies followed from those uh, original observations to demonstrate that the administration of uh, an anti-alpha-4 beta-7 monoclonal antibody around the time of HIV infection was able to prevent transmission in a significant proportion of animals. And in fact, uh, those who got infected also had lower dissemination of the virus in tissues. In 2016, the same team 
show that uh, the uh, administration of this uh, N-Telta 4 beta 7 monoclonal antibody, this time two months from the infection, and at a time when the subjects were already receiving antiretroviral therapy, was able to achieve prolonged virologic control following treatment discontinuation. So clearly an important observation for two reasons. Uh, first of all, because of its potential in inducing heart-free remission in HIV-infected patients. And the second reason, because of the availability of the equivalent of the n 4 beta 7 monoclonal antibody for humans. I'm talking of the vedolizumab, uh, which is uh, used in the treatment of uh, um, inflammatory bowel disease. And, and so two studies were undertaken from our programs. A study of vedolizumab in HIV-infected individuals and we will hear results tomorrow from uh, Dr. Fauci. And a study to confirm and extend the published non-human primate study, this study. So 22 Indian rhesus macaques, negative for MAMU A001, B008, and B017. So we excluded all the alleles that are known to be associated with the spontaneous control of viral replication were infected intravenously with 200 TCID50 of SAV mac 239 nef stop which was provided as a courtesy from uh, François Villinger. Five weeks uh, post-infection, so we are here, um, animals received uh, combination antiretroviral therapy with two popular uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors and an integrase inhibitor under study at Merck. For weeks following initiation of ART, the animals were randomized for sex, weight, and area under the curve of a load from time of infection mm -hmm. to receive the first uh, infusion of a primatized anti-alpha-4 beta-7 monoclonal antibody or the control antibody for a total of eight infusions. Following the fourth infusion, uh, ART was stopped. The anti-alpha-4 beta-7 antibody levels in the plasma were measured using ELISA in Dr. Baruch's lab and plasma SIV RNA levels and CD4 T cell counts were monitored approximately every two weeks for about one year. Again, redundantly, but important to keep in mind that the study used the same virus, ART regimen, NTFA 4 beta 7 antibody preparation, as in this, and also the study design, as in the viral ready paper. Anti drug antibody levels were measured by ELISA in Dr. Ryman's lab. And the sample size was a little bit larger than the EMORI study. We have here 12 active and 10 in the control group to achieve greater than 80% power to detect at least two log difference in virologic set points between the two arms. So here I'm showing the SIV RNA levels in the active group in the top, in the control, and in the bottom, the geometric means. So it's a, it's a panel that speaks by itself. Clearly, we don't see difference uh, in between the two arms in terms of virologic set point. To the right, I'm showing the CD4 cell counts uh, in both groups uh, and the geometric mean. During the period of anti antibody administration, we see an increase in CD4 T cells, but then this difference is lost uh, immediately after the last uh, infusion. So in our study, we are not uh, able to uh, reproduce uh, the observation from uh, the viral ready study. But before moving to the next uh, slide, I would like you to focus on these uh, uh, virologic set points, which are quite spread between two log to seven log or more. So, but what is different uh, from our study and the viral ready study? Well, certainly in the viral ready, we don't see the difference in virologic set point between the two arms, and both in terms of virus, but also the immunologic set point was different in the two groups. Uh, not only this, if we focus only on the control group, it looks like that uh, our control group shows a viremia that is approximately one to two log lower than the control group from memory. And the CD4 count actually are also higher, 400, 500 CD4 counts higher than the control group from memory. So it looks like that for reasons that we don't understand, this virus uh, is more virulent uh, in the emory animals than uh, our NIAD animals. So are there reasons to believe that this virus uh, could establish such huge heterogeneity variability in virologic set points? The answer is yes. Because like I said, this is not SIV MAC239, it's an SIV MAC239 NEF stop. So there is this codon that makes uh, the NEF non-functional. 
but then in vivo, once administered, this uh, virus uh, repairs the NEF stop through cycles of uh, reverse transcription. And so uh, we just leave some, we sequenced the virus, uh, and uh, we found that, uh, of course, a baseline in the, the viral stock is 100% a NEF stop virus, as uh, represented in these uh, full uh, dark pie charts in these three representative animals. By week five, post-infection, all animals had their uh, virus reverted to NEF open, but with different uh, flavors, as you can see, different sub amino acid substitution. At week two, post-infection, post on the other hand, um, some virus uh, had already reverted to NEF open, but some virus still had uh, a huge proportion of uh, NEF stop, in fact, up to 90%. So uh, these could... Uh, affect the viral replication is in fact captured by the inverse correlation between the percentage of SIV MAC to 39F stop and the plasma viral load at week two post infection. So are there reasons to think that this uh, early replication can have a profound effect on the set point? And the answer is yes. So if we just uh, dichotomize clustered animals only in those that uh, uh, achieved higher than five log of varemia, the red animals, and those that achieved less than four log varemia, the more lucky animals, the blue, and these solid lines are geometric means, um, what we found is that uh, the early replication uh, of the benign animals seems to fall consistently below the, the red curve. The blue curve are below the red curve. And actually, these are little fluctuations because the peak Varemia is not associated with the set point. But if we dig further into this analysis, uh, we, we see that uh, the level of replication before initiation of ART and, interestingly, uh, the level of replication during ART seems to be uh, a stronger predictor of uh, the virologic set point. So it's a slide that shows from another angle that uh, the antibody uh, Alpha, alpha 4, beta 7 had little impact, if any, uh, to uh, predict the uh, output because the, the outcome, because the early dynamics seems to explain better what happens uh, in the set point. In fact, of the red animals, uh, of the eight red animals, four fall in the active group and four in the control group. Whereas the 10 more benign animals, of so the 10 more benign animals, say six fall in the active group and four in the control group. So in conclusion, in a study design similar to the Barreredi paper using the same virus, ART regimen, and anti-alpha-4, beta-7 antibody preparation, we did not see any effect of treatment with the anti-alpha-4, beta-7 on vacal load following ART discontinuation. The difference in results from those reported by Barreredi et al. is not explained by the viral stock, lot of antibody use or development of an anti-drug antibodies, genetic or other differences in macaque studies or other factors, including differences in virus host balance related to differential kinetics and pathway of the NEF stop repair, may have contributed to the different results observed. And with this, I would like to thank all my collaborators and Thank also the entire division of veterinary resources in our agency for the amazing work they do uh, in supporting our animal studies and for the uh, animal care, and our colleagues uh, from the Bararedi paper who provided us reagents and for helpful discussion. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, the original paper also discussed other biological variables that were associated with the treatment, like retinoic acid levels and a series of uh, changes of activation in the innate compartment. If you look, did you have a chance to look at those parameters independently of our load, or are they, they meaning that they track with or without the lack of suppression? No, we have not uh, started yet uh, this analysis, but uh, certainly NK cell activation is one of the uh, analysis uh, we uh, want to advance, um, uh, and also um, probably we will look also at the level of uh, retinoic acid and other markers of immune activation, but none of them have been uh, run at this point. Thank you, Michele. A very impressive result in the original manuscript was also 
a very significant reduction of the measure of our reservoir in the gut. So I was wondering if you have been able to replicate at least that result. What is your data? Yes, actually, uh, the good news is that we have the samples, but we don't have the results yet. Those are also <laughs> boiling. <laughs> we don't have the results on the tissues. Um, there was an interesting uh, paper published from the NIH, I think just a couple of months ago, in mucosal immunology, where it showed that the, the vulnerability of rhesus macaques to shiv challenge, rectal challenge, uh, was different in two sets of rhesus macaque uh, that had been obtained from different colonies. And you may be familiar with this, but when they worked it up, it turned out that both uh, the two different colonies had different microbiomes. And in fact, the macaques that were more vulnerable uh, had a Prevotella dominant microbiome, which actually translated to a more activated GOLT immune system. And I know it's perhaps not that likely, but it's not inconceivable that the two different studies may have had different animals with different microbiomes, which could play into GOLT replication. Oh, yes, those are two different colonies, uh, for sure. We, what we, uh, we did was to perform uh, uh, ancestry genetic testing to be sure uh, that we were dealing with the same species without the contamination from other uh, um, uh, uh, strain, like, for instance, uh, some of these papers discuss about the potential uh, contamination of the Chinese into the rhesus. But we found that our animals are pure rhesus uh, monkeys. Now, there is, all, there is an entire work of uh, uh, genetic uh, analysis we will uh, run in order to compare with the uh, Barareddy study, and uh, so probably we'll interrogate also microbiome, but uh, there, is lots of, there, is a, there are a lot of tests now we have to do. In part, it will depend also on the availability of the samples from both studies uh, in order to optimize the type of questions we want to play. I, I think in this paper, the differences were purely microbiome. They weren't about the species. It was just the gut flora was different. Thanks. Thanks for the feedback. Roughly the same question. So I assume the monkeys are SPF in both colonies. Are they super clean? I mean, are they negative for CMV, which may expand the, the, the central memory pool differently? Yes, all our NAD animals are SPF, so they are uh, uh, negative for all the uh, SRV. And uh, CMV, actually, I'm not sure. This is a question that we, should, super, uh, we should ask. Yes. CMV, I'm not sure viruses, that it, yeah. So there, are, there are other. Herpes, no, herpes, uh, SRV, and. Uh, all the STLV, all, all, they are SPF animals, so I think it's, uh, they're, they're clean for, uh, from this angle. So there's, a, there's um, a, a paper from People that's been posted online in a, in a pre-review pre process from, I think, a group in New York uh, that looked at um, uh, HIV-infected people with, I think, IBD <laughs> who got treated with the drug. And um, they, not a lot going on with the reservoirs, maybe something, but um, I think they found very consistent findings that the follicles broke down, which would give some mechanism to what, what it may be happening should this approach ever work. Uh, did you look at that? No, again, in, we, we have not uh, still analyzed any of the tissues, but certainly I think the follicles is, and the lymph nodes is one of the areas we want to look at, yes, to understand if we can find an explanation for the uh, differences in between the two groups of animals, uh, studies, uh, and also some other correlate of uh, uh, progression in our group. So certainly the follicles uh, is an interesting uh, um, question, and probably even uh, by looking at the kinetics of uh, heart uh, uh, induction in, virus, in, in, viral, in viral decrease, there seems to be evidence of uh, a second phase compartment this, that is more refilled in the group of animals that uh, progress faster. So the second phase uh, could be associated, at least it has been uh, modeled years ago, with the dissociation of virus from uh, the complement receptor. And so maybe uh, it, the, the entry into the follicles uh, is a very bad thing if for the um, intervention, for, for, for an optimal intervention. Uh, 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 that helps to transform normal progressors in uh, uh, long-term non-progressors. I think it's uh, some, some, something that is uh, absolutely uh, important. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I would just like to make a general comment about uh, this session today, we, and even in general uh, at this conference, we heard quite I heard quite some uh, neutral or negative uh, results, and of course sometimes in science we might 
want it to be different, but uh, I'm very happy that actually it presented here because it's so important that also that knowledge is, <coughs> is going to go out into the world. And I actually would like to make a call to a lot of you who are also in journals and on panels and editors there to make sure that all these results are being uh, yeah, uh, going out into the world. So uh, thank you. Well, I, I appreciate that comment also. I'm Robert Reinhardt, and I guess my question is really for any member of the panel, including Steve. You know, since we've had this ATI discussion about, you know, its utility, you know, on the basis of the original study, we have three human trials using ATI um, as part of the design, and now we have this information. And I just wonder how you reflect now in hindsight or Moving forward, and maybe Dr. Fauci is going to have some further comment about this tomorrow. I'm going to really listen to that. But, um, so uh, let's say we're, let's say he wasn't giving a presentation tomorrow. We only had this. What would you say either about the ongoing studies or the the way in which we plan studies to go forward, mm -hmm. even if we had not started these other ones? Yeah. So um, I don't think that uh, this observation is uh, uh, a red light, is uh, to, to, to continue this investigation. Certainly it's not a green light. So I think that we, we need to absorb a little bit more this data and to hear more uh, what Dr. Fauci has to say tomorrow. And also there are also other studies, NHP studies that are also advancing uh, as part of this uh, a roadmap initiative between the NIID and Harvard University. And so I think by the end of the summer, hopefully by the fall, we will have all this data to make a point. I don't think it's a, a negative result because we are seeing something new that we were not expecting. So we, we are opening a question instead of closing a question. But certainly we need to elaborate and absorb all this data before making new uh, uh, designs, I guess. Okay, we're, yeah, we're, um, I'm not, a fan. I think the monkey, mo the monkey model is a great model for pathogenesis and, um, but not necessarily a gatekeeper for clinical trials. So there is the original report, but there's a lot of other papers out there, um, including the one I just mentioned, providing some mechanism of actions by which this approach might actually have an impact on the reservoir. So I actually think these clinical trials should go forward. Um, if they had treatment interruptions because they were trying to repeat, repeat the cure, yeah, I, I, would, I would be a little bit hesitant in that regard, but getting the safety data, the immunology data, the, 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 the follicular breakdown data, any tissue data, for sure, I would do um, if, the, if the drug is safe, safe, and safe, which, which, is a, which actually is probably a bigger question right now. Um, but I would reconsider. I don't think there's any compelling reason to do a treatment interruption now like there is in her study. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, and before everybody leaves, we're not quite done. Uh, I'm going to welcome oh. Steve. Yes. Steve and colleagues back to the podium uh, to discuss and announce the International AIDS Society, the Abivax Research for Cure Academy Fellowship Prize. I was given something to read, but I lost it. Um, but I know what I'm supposed to talk about in general. So about several months ago, or about a year ago, um, the IAS organized uh, a really inspiring meeting that happened in South Africa in which um, we brought, I think, about 24 young investigators, people who knew something about CURE but were not cure, working in the CURE environment. We, we came together in this remote part uh, in, in South Africa. We had some international faculty with some local faculty. We spent three or four days uh, going over some of the basics of science, forming programs, forming projects, um, and, and bonding. And, and it was very inspiring, and we're going to do it again in, uh, in a few months. And the whole idea is, and this is really the big mission of the IS, is to sort of move some of this science from where it's being done in labs like Tim and I in San Francisco, uh, you know, to where the epidemic is. And, and, and we're making that kind of progress. And, um, at this, and, and so Abivax has approached us. Um, uh, they've heard about this initiative, and they want to um, acknowledge uh, a, a single person. And we had a lot of trouble figuring out who it would be. 
um, who would get an award with the, with 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 the, actually a very nice award. But I'll let them give them the award. Thanks, Steve. Just to say a little word, Abivax is a French biotech company, and we have a compound indeed in which is moving into phase 2B for uh, HIV cure by, because we have first data that indeed it could reduce um, total HIV DNA. Now, one main um, uh, expert and advisor in order to get to that stage was Mark Weinberg. And so when Mark unfortunately passed away last year, we approached IES to see how could we pay tribute to Mark. And so IES directed us towards this prize, which we are delighted about because it combines both passions from Mark, HIV cure research and also uh, resource limited settings research. So I think it's a combination of both, which is really great. And so the academy, and of course we are totally outside of that, but the academy, the co-chairs of the academy, um, chose uh, as first recipient uh, Paradise uh, Madlala from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. I would all... So his research interest is on uh, characterization of uh, HIV-1 LTR uh, uh, promoter, essential, of course, in driving viral transcription and productive infection. So congratulations again, uh, Dr. Matala. Yes, no, Par Paradise was absolutely inspiring and enthusiastic through it, throughout the entire session. And do you want to say something? You don't have to. Are you shy? <laughs> he wouldn't stop talking at the meeting, but... Uh... <laughs> just say thank you. Uh, thank you to, um, to Steve and the entire team of IS for um, nominating and selecting me for this prize. And um, I want to say thank you also to Apivex um, for uh, handing the prize to me. I'm very much inspired. And also, I will uh, attribute uh, every work that I've been doing uh, to the mentoring and um, guidance by Professor Ndungu. Thank you very much.